Within just a year or two after having our son, Nelson, um, Ash and I were three days from divorce, going through fighting for custody of our son. I was a drug addict, and our lives were upside down. We were a million and a half dollars in debt, $99,000 overdrawn, and our whole life was falling apart. So the pressure of that was just building and building, and I kept hearing in the back of my mind, this life you have is not worth living. You ought, to, you ought to kill yourself. We had this old historic house, and I went up in the attic of it. And it was a junky old house that kind of re represented our junky old life, just broken and needing of everything. And went in the attic of that house and moved the attic fan out of the way, had set up a rope, and I decided I was just going to hang myself, that, that if I would take my own life, it would be the very best thing that could happen. And during that time, something just, just moved me, cry out to a God I never knew. And I thought, oh my gosh, he was there all along. And I kept hearing kill myself and he was going die to yourself. And it sounded so similar. And when I went down those stairs, I met Ash just r right after that. And we had been, of course, fighting through this divorce. I said, I got saved. And she said, you're a liar. Yeah, I didn't believe him when he came downstairs and tried to tell me that he was different. I just thought it was one more thing that he was trying to do to manipulate me to stay or to do something that would cause me to lose Nelson. But um, about, let me see, that was probably April, May. By October, early November of that same year, I found out I was pregnant, but I was still having this affair with this other gentleman, mainly because I was scared to be left alone. I had someone on the side that would accept me and laugh with me and what I thought loved me, and I didn't want to let go of that just in case John was playing me. And, um, and so anyhow, yeah, I, I sat there pregnant not knowing whose child I had. And it was just, it was terrifying. That's when those little seeds of maybe, but what if this is real? What if he really is that person that has changed? What if that means you can change? What if that means there's something greater in you? I was about right at eight weeks pregnant and knew something was just wrong, you know. So I went to the doctor and he confirmed that um, I had lost the child. And, and so I just, I, I just I literally puddled on the floor in a heap and just cried the hardest I think I've ever cried. And I just sat there and was like, oh dear God, you've got to help me, get me away from me, you know. Um, and I had the most wonderful experience from there. <laughs> I stood up and I was so different and I had not done anything. I had not done anything at all besides surrender. Through years of counseling and lots of slowly by slowly decisions, we found one another and began to build a life that was amazing. So for seven years, literally seven years, every week, we went to counseling. We ended up being, gosh, like the poster child for failed marriages, but for people that just wanted a glimpse of hope. We just attracted broken people um, because they were attracted to our story, that there's, there's hope for people who are broken, that there's beauty in broken things. That was not just what happened to us, but that's what God wanted to do through us. Say Vega. Remember, we're doing rolling doors on those. That so we truck. started our construction company with $1,000. Ash would teach our son during the day, and I'd go out and do rot repair on houses, working for just a little bit of money and one paycheck at a time. God was working on our skill set. You know, God doesn't waste time. He's always taking what you're doing and weaving it into where you're going. Coming together. We began to put our heart, all of our resources, our time, energy, and our dreams into this little small town, Opelika, which we say it's kind of like Hopelika. 
we decided that we wanted to be right here where we had our first child. Everything, all of our first happened right here within a block away. We believe that hyper-focus in any area can change it. And so we just decided to stay here. So we have a real estate company that has over 100 pieces of property, primarily locally within 10 blocks of this where we're sitting right now. From that developed our construction company because we actually couldn't afford to hire other contractors. Now we're a historic renovation business. And out of that came our architectural salvage business. We're a restaurant group with multiple restaurants. We have a consulting company that's my primary focus, which is helping people restore cities. We call ourselves Marsh Collective now because I've tried to find a way to bring together multiple companies, multiple entities, multiple ownerships into a, a singular way to communicate. What I believe we're trying to accomplish is community in the truest sense. Literally, your neighbors are leaning up against the fence, talking to each other, like trusting each other, having hard conversations, but understanding that those hard conversations don't bring differences. They, they bring understanding. And we're going in and helping people in towns from 800 all the way to you know, 80,000 people turn their towns around and make them amazing places. So you want me to take this, this off and sit the door out here with this wall? Yeah, just frame it back. What okay. we realized is that when it comes to saving communities, the capital it takes to do that is in three ways. It's, it's patient capital, it's properly aligned capital, and then it's it's also productive capital. Yeah, let's do that then. Okay, so I'll tear this off. These two doors. Okay. And so when we say patient capital, they have to understand it's it's three to five years, seven years sometimes at the outside for for it to really begin to be the kind of investment that investors are used to oftentimes. So three, which way would you like this one open? I mean, it's up to you, whatever you think. It's either that way or that way. Properly aligned, they, people have to have vision and values. The vision means they want it to be saved. The values is that they want to make a generational difference. And then last, the productive part. We think cities should have return of your capital and then return on your capital. Because what happens is we've seen cities where people try to build them only through benevolence. And what we found out is that's not a sustainable model. But we knew this, if we could build things that were sustainable, profitable, and thoughtful, that they could have a very long life. And so we dream 50, 75, and 100 years for our city, and then we help others um, dream that for theirs. The priority goal for us is to find out who this loving God is, seems pretty cool that he would meet us in the place that he did because it wasn't in where we told we had to be to meet him. It wasn't in a church and it wasn't in this special moment of a certain song being played or someone praying with us, you know? It was just us, raw, dirty, jacked up us. There is hope. You know, that, that God loves idiots that God still takes broken things and does beautiful things, that there is an amazing God that still does amazing things. And what we do is we try to translate hope into every environment, that there is hope.